Henry, um, thank you ever so much for making the effort to, to come along this evening. Um, so I'm the creative director of the SHED project um, and just to clarify a little bit more around what SHED is. Um, so some of that is, is started to be outlined in this document but also um, the main thing is that SHED is a space for conversation. It's a, it's a place where we want to be able to invite people in to work with us collaboratively to think about what kind of conversations need to be happening and how do we think about that in terms of transforming the way we think about things, shedding preconceptions of each other or of places, but also thinking about how we could actually create a mobile space that reconfigures. So playing again with that, that language of shedding preconceptions, transforming the space and transforming the way we might engage with things and thinking about how it's an interdisciplinary approach to practice. So it's inviting artists, designers, um, uh, technicians, and also where it's not doing arts commissioning program work, where it also then delivers and operates as a public service space. So one of the things when we were first coming up with the idea of the SHED project, I was really keen that for if it offered a writer's residency, that it also then was a pop-up library. If it worked with taxidermy artists, that then it also was a toy library. Um, so that it was thinking about how do we blend arts practice and cultural policy and strategy and real need, and how we can do that through the design of a creative project. Um, so, that, so it's unfinished deliberately, it looks unfinished, it looks open because it's constantly wanting to invite you in to engage with it and to suggest what it could be for you. So one of the strap lines that we're developing now is that idea, that invitation to say what could SHED be for you, what, what, what would you like to do on it um, and how might you take part in the project and help it to continue to tour. So that's kind of where... where uh, my role and where the kind of idea for a shed came from and then I think most people in this room have been roped into that shed project in one way or another um, I must point out Simon I'm going to embarrass you here Simon is the master builder um, and so yeah. <laughs> bad and the medium kind of okay ideas, none of it would be possible without without Simon and without the students that are here, just wave and bear <laughs> And we also took part in a, a live module at the University of Derby with the interior design tutors, Barend and Giovanna, who worked really hard. <laughs> harebrained idea and saying yeah come in and work with us on a module and let's see what happens and here we are today launching the shed before it actually starts to go on tour and already we have about two years worth of programmed tour work to date but there's still space for more so, um, so that's me hi there um, my name is Michelle Achiroi um, I'm an academic with the Centre for Cultural Media Policy Studies at the University of Warwick uh, I'm also director of Urban Lab, uh, which is a consultancy that works in research and strategy um, with cultural and creative organisations. Um, my interest in SHED comes very much from a, a, from a researcher's perspective, um, trying to uh, understand how um, impact and um, evaluation can happen for a, 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 a space, um, which is a community space and a, a place-based um, initiative. So that's my sort of um, area of interest, if you may, and that's where I'm coming from in terms of um, SHED. Thanks, Fish. You've just taken all the words I was going to say about why <laughs> I am here. I am Victoria. I am a research impact officer and researcher at the University of Derby. Um, I am apparently also the evaluation manager for SHED because it says so on the brochure, so <laughs> that must be true. And in terms of what uh, I'm particularly interested in looking at as that evaluation is the community and the research sides of SHED. Panels? Too much. Uh, not so much the commissioning because there's so much of it, I think that might be an impossible task, but it's still really interesting. So that's where I am coming from and why I'm here. 
Uh, hello, my name is Ben, and um, I am the creative producer of The Shed. Um, so it's my role to kind of um, look at all these different money pots and see how they all kind of come together to create one big money pot that makes it all possible. Um, I'm also the creative producer of um, an artist development programme um, for theatre makers um, in Derby and the region um, called Ingram Company. Um, so the, uh, the one thing I'm particularly proud of about the team is that we are cross-disciplinary, so there's so many different artists with so many different um, types of art form. Um, and that they can all in some way feature in the shed and all inform each other in a really beautiful way. Um, so the list is endless of things that will happen in the shed over the next, well, I don't know, forever. Um, and, and it just keeps growing and growing and that's because of the amount of artists and the amount of different types of art forms and artworks that can happen in the shed as a commissioning space as well. But also to embed that in the community, to co-create with the community. Um, I, I also really like the idea that each of the team members for the shed have been given a, um, a, a part of the shed. Um, so um, I'm also known as the roof. Um, so make of that what you will. Uh, yeah. Do you want to go? Okay, I don't know how to follow that. The roof. <laughs> wow. So, uh, my name is Alex Nunn, I'm a Professor of Political Economy at the University of Derby. Um, and, and my kind of background is not in cultural work, but I am interested in both long and short term patterns in the production and reproduction of inequalities of different types and the way in which the cultural reproduction of place uh, might shape that, those inequalities. So, both big places like big spaces like the British economy, but also uh, more micro spaces and certainly over the last year we've been doing some work with Derby Theatre around Derby as a place uh, and as a place that produces particular types of uh, social relations. So that's my interest in using perhaps shed, using SHED as a particip participatory place to um, perhaps intervene in the reproduction of those inequalities to make uh, in a more egalitarian way. But we'll maybe perhaps talk more about that in a moment. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Baynard. I'm an artist who's based here at Primary and I'm also the engagement curator. So I run a public programme here, and including a long-term programme called Making Place, which is a deliberate inversion of placemaking because I have a problem with it. lots of the stuff that comes with Place making. So hopefully we'll get into that. Um, and I guess uh, just briefly within my own practice, I've made a lot of mobile structures that I've taken, and I've taken into many public spaces. And um, I find, I guess, it was like a kind of uh, a really exciting way of working to be able to um, create something that. Uh, I could use to perform experiments in public space, but also as a, as a space for kind of dialogue and interaction. Um, and I'm also really interested in art that happens um, in, in sites that's very specific to those sites, but that doesn't necessarily need to stay there. Um, and then in terms of the Shed project, I'm, I'm learning about it. <laughs> but I'm uh, also really, interested, like, really excited to see the structure and see how it can be used sort of in, when it's in its rest periods here at Primary with the artists in the building but also with all the different local communities we work with and the projects that we're running that, um, it, yeah, I, I can see loads of potential for how that can be used here, so that's exciting. Um, thank you very much, my name's Mikai, I'm from the Mighty Creatives, um, the uh, regional organisation that's about transforming young people's lives through arts and culture. Um, and thank you, I'm a bit late today, so apologies for that. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation to join you. Um, my background is in community arts and arts education. Um, in TMC, we have a kind of programme at the moment, it's finished called Emerge, it's been about placemaking across the Midlands, uh, again using arts and culture, um, developing programmes with young artists, by young artists for young people, which has been terrific. Um, I think what piqued my interest in SHED was uh, many years ago I worked with a company called Arts Team, uh, some of you may know. They're a visual arts research facility in Barrow and Furness, up in the sort of wider, wider breadth depths of uh, Cumbria. They're a fantastic company to work with, and if you ever get a chance to see them go and work, please do. Um, they started a programme a few years ago called Sheds, 
because um, the thing Barrow is known for, um, amongst other things, is its submarine industry. They have a huge BAE complex there, um, which locally they refer to as being housed in their sheds. So um, I was working up there for a bit, and one morning you could walk across this little bridge and out overnight pop this very modest sized submarine, which apparently was nuclear, and apparently that if a tugboat in New York had been switched on, they could have detected it in Barrow. So that was a bit of a kind of moment. So the notion of sheds with this kind of, you know, amateur DIY kind of aesthetic is fantastic, but in the context of submarine yards and nuclear warfare, it had another layer altogether. Um, and I've been in touch with the guys in our team, uh, Maddie and Stuart, and they're so very interested in what we're doing here. Um, I was hoping they'd come down today, but they can't, but that's cool. Um, but I'm hoping there'll be, as well as kind of links across the region, we can kind of reach out to Barra on all points north, south, east, and west. Thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, just a, a, quick, a quick question then to follow up from some of these points we've heard about big space for the British economy, the big space, uh, small place, this idea of city, um, uh, making place or place making, um, and then big sheds uh, as opposed to small sheds. Um, so I'm just thinking uh, in terms of um, the shed project, what, what would impact can projects like this have? What impact can, can, can mobile projects have? If it has the potential to travel, if it has the potential to, to, to be reconfigured, which is a word we've also used a few times, how might we start to think about the impact that that could have to our cities, um, to our notions of place, and to our notions of making place? Does anybody want to address that? Using the word impact, it's one of those words, and it's sort of it's kind of military. It's about what kind of impact can you kind of make on something. When I think actually we're looking at difference on what kind of positive change we can make and things like that. And I know impact is one of those funny words we have to use, but I think it's horribly kind of invasive and uh, a nasty word, really. So I'd like to put a vote up and say let's not use the word impact, but find other ways of talking about the difference we can make. So what difference um, <laughs> do you think um, mobile place, uh, reconfigured place, um, venues that move as well, which is a new concept perhaps for some of us who work in buildings that don't move, or perhaps talk to venues that usually don't move. What, what can a, a venue do when it moves? Okay, I, I love thunder. <laughs> Starting out by uh, saying let's not think about no. that. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I suppose one of the ways that we're immediately using, or two of the ways in which we're immediately using Shed is as a place to both disseminate um, findings from work with young people about how they feel about the city and the places that they live in and perhaps not always live in actually. Some, some of the work um, was juxtaposing young people's experience of a place, um, but then juxtaposing that with people who, young people who were in care, so they didn't really know the place. So this was a, quite an interesting uh, way of, of getting to their understanding of that. And so we're showing that work next um, Saturday in uh, Derby City Centre. Uh, so Shed will be a venue for showing that co-created work, but also a venue for collecting audience responses to that work as a means of merging both uh, dissemination and research uh, and, and data collection. And then into the autumn we go into a phase of using Shed's mobile capacity to uh, relocate uh, uh, various data collection activities around the city. Um, so being mobile is very much part of that process and I, I strongly suspect actually will be mobile in the process of doing that, so the, the, the pods may well move around as we undertake that process and learn where uh, and how Shed might facilitate more authentic and comfortable uh, uh, process of data collection of data with uh, initially young people, but then actually the demographic for the, that project has shifted, so it won't just be young people anymore. I think um, the main difference uh, that um, 
uh, a space like Shed could make is uh, one, trying to bring people in that um, wouldn't normally come uh, to another space because it's less intimidating for them if you encounter them in a place where, where they are rather than them having to travel to you. So obviously it, it removes those boundaries. But also I think just the, the nature of Shed and all the associations, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about that in, in, in a few minutes, I think it just gives them some kind of a, um, a point at which they can connect or uh, bring their own sort of experiences um, to to the project. So I think the, f the fact that Shed is mobile and the fact that the Shed is going to go to places is one, removing barriers, but equally also kind of enriching from the individuals who come to the Shed, their own, uh, bringing to the Shed their own experience or understanding of what this place might be and what it might offer for them. So I think that's probably one of the, um, well, two of the most sort of interesting uh, things that this, this project, difference that this project could make. I was just, I was just going to think. Um, I'm just conscious of, uh, for me, it's about, um, because it's mobile and it's transforming, um, it becomes about people and not about buildings or, or venues. Um, so we, we, we see the people in, in the shed that are making work on the shed or are talking in the shed or are um, receiving a haircut in the shed rather than it being about, um, you know, uh, the heating of the shed or you know or those sort of really um, practical things that we talk about when we talk about buildings it becomes about the people and because it transforms because the shed will transform and is transformative then the shed becomes it, it becomes live it becomes like another person and therefore the, the people that are working with the shed are working in collaboration with it and seeing how it makes and works together and how you know it becomes another collaborator. You know, are we going to have it in this shape or that shape? Uh, will the roof come off? Will you know? Will it blow up? What will happen <coughs> to the shed um, with that person? In it? So it just becomes a bit more of a live space, and then it just becomes more about people and less about buildings. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess my thought and answer to the question is, it depends. Like, if if it's this sort of uh, I see. I see it as a frame almost, and like, I think I think of um, a lot of projects, mobile projects that I've been involved with, in a similar way. Is that like they offer a kind of a framework or a structure within which or around which something happens, and obviously what happens depends on how you, how well you plan the project and the relationships that you build and the invitation. And um, but I think that the kind of structure itself and its mobility offers two things that are really important. One is a kind of um, a cur like this, it stimulates curiosity. I think when something appears that hasn't been there before and it's only there temporarily, there's often a curiosity, especially with a, a space like that, which is very familiar, like although it's going to be configured, the shed is very familiar and it's a space you want to nosy into. Um, and also the kind of scale of it has an intimacy, which I think enables a type of interaction or conversation that um, I've experienced in the caravan Brianne's familiar from another project, so kind of a caravan, or I've done a lot of work in markets, and it sort of reminds me when it's opened up in a market store. So I think that there's um, maybe there's a sort of a visual language that um, that helps with annotation, and then how it's used is how it's used. So yeah, it could be it could be successful or not depending. But the, the curiosity thing is actually the one I was going to mention because we talked at quite an early stage about putting the shed somewhere but not announcing that and so people would find it in a place or a space that they already knew but they were then encouraged to re-interrogate that and have a conversation about the shed before they explored it and, and so that kind of sense of connection with a place that actually you thought you already knew but that space has been transformed by having something else put into it um, is something that I think would be quite interesting and impactful difference making. I like the idea of me being a research difference officer. There's some room in that metaphor really, which I think actually it could be a space that listens deeply to its local geography or local communities. I think it would be fascinating. You could do the equivalent of listening to a tugboat in New York, not in a surveillance way, but in a kind of deep understanding, find out about the world right here, right now way. I think that would be quite an achievement. 
John Burgess said, if I am a storyteller, it is because I listen. And this idea of listening to a community, listening to a place, listening to a space, and I'm struck as well by Ben's point about it being live. Um, it's, it's organic, it's human, um, and Victoria's point about conversation. And I'm wondering how, how dialogue plays a part in this project, because I know this is part of Rhiannon's research interests and perhaps connects a few of us around the table. Um, so how might it start a dialogue? How might this project or projects like this start a dialogue with people, with places, with spaces? I'll get straight on in there then. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the, the first sort of questions <coughs> that uh, I was asking in my research was around how do you design dialogue? So some of the interest I have in the way that we design conversation through architectural and performative uh, methods and how do you blend those in a way that it's still very open and, uh, and live and engaging. And so um, part of what um, Shed is, is the premise for Shed is on that, how do we design dialogue, how do we encourage that to happen. So part of that thinking about the Shed being something everyday and familiar, that most people have a story or some way of connecting to it. I find that quite often people connect with the project before even coming and seeing it. So for a lot of people here, we've been talking about this shed, but actually seeing it today for the first time. And it's really interesting that the, the, the reaction of, it is actually a shed, or it's bigger than I thought, or smaller than I thought, or you know, the colour is like um, a, a shed my granddad had, or it smells like we were talking about the smells of a shed as well and how they trigger. Simon did a presentation to the students in January about his granddad's shed and we had this image of a very, very neat, tidy shed and then another relative whose shed looks like a bomb had gone off inside it. So there's all these kind of really interesting personal connections that I think we all have to the ideas of, of sheds and I think that's been partly what has been, hopefully, the buy-in to the project and then um, the thinking about how how people want to then take ownership of it because it is that kind of offer the project is an offering to others as well so I know a lot of you in the room are connected with the project and with some of the tour and delivery of it so so that's really important I think the, the idea of the everyday in place making so I was struck by a couple of things that people have already said about the the curiosity element, so that seems to me if you draw, so, so a lot of what I do is kind of social research, I do surveys, I go out and ask people predetermined questions, I've already very structured <laughs> samples of people that I want to speak to. So in that sense, and that, that, that kind of research, especially when you're trying to get into quite personal data, so quite often I'm thinking about parenting strategies or hopes for kids' futures and, th and things like that. Um, the venue in which you do work has quite an impact on the nature of the data that you can collect from. Uh, and you, you usually have two, two choices. You're either inviting people to a university, which is quite a formal, off-putting place in itself, and then shut them in a locked office or a shut office, because you don't want to um, you know, broadcast their, their messages to everybody else. Or you go to their homes, in which case you kind of intervene in their lives in quite a threatening, or it feels sometimes quite a, quite a, quite a threatening way. And it just seems to me, or oh, you can use a cafe or a public venue, but that's awkward because other people can over here. And it just struck me that Shed offers a way, the curiosity point offers a way that for respondents to turn the, the questions around, so they're immediately asking questions of, uh, of me as a researcher, but also it's a space that's kind of not that threatening because everybody's familiar with the shed, as you say, but it's also open yet closed, public yet private, that, that kind of uh, juxtaposition of ideas, that is certainly what you said, Bishop, right at the, the outset, it becomes a, a venue to create different kinds of, of, of research dialogue, certainly so different kinds of research dialogue to what I'm, to what I'm used to. Yeah, just going back to the question about how to create dialogue, one thing, um, I, moved, I moved to Nottingham about five years ago, and I've hardly been here before then. So when I moved here, moving around the place was really weird because you've got no sense of roots or history or connection. So you could wander around listening to people, you can't understand what people say. You could understand words, but you could understand sentences. You have no idea. 
But you realise after a period of time, you little things happen that connect you to a bit of place, and you get a little bit of story around each of those places. And after a period of time, you, you get a sense of story and place as you've been there. But what it occurred to me was it's like hyperlinks. If you could sort of hyperlink the shed, that every bit of it, inside or outside or around it, had a bit of linkage to it. People would know those linkages. You build stories up around the hyperlinks of the, of, of the thing itself, you know. So I think in terms of how you how you create dialogue, I think it's about hyperlinking it and demonstrating it has links to lots of other places. But we won't necessarily that, we won't get that at all. But people there will do. You know, it might, be, it might land on somebody's space that's got, will have a kind of history and conflict within it as well, which will generate story and generate dialogue. So the shed is a, as a link, as a, as a meeting it's place, place. Yeah. as a hyperlink, um, place of conversation, a safe space, maybe a neutral space of conversation. Um, I'm thinking as well now from an artistic point of view, um, an artist's working in research, which is another, I've used the word research a few times. Um, one of the questions this panel was, was, was asked to think about was, how does artistic research engineer or imagine alternative sites for practice? So, and I don't know, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we're using words like impact, I suppose, is because it's coming from, from a research context where we have to think about the impact of research a lot in the university environment. But also, I think, to think about how artistic research can, can engineer or imagine or turn inside out the kind of usual way of experiencing or encountering um, artwork, practice. Does anybody want to explore? Can I just, sorry, I sort of was going to talk about question, but I uh, might be able to link it to the Santi. I um, guess there was a, a couple of things um, that, that I wanted to say about dialogue, one of which is kind of coming back to what Nick said about listening, about creating spaces for listening. I think that um, if you're trying to make projects that are place-based, and especially if you don't know that place, like that deep listening is a really important place to start. And, listening can happen in lots of different ways and, and that working with artists can be a really interesting way of exploring different types of listening that they might be, um, I mean, I, want, I also want you to know you challenged the, the term impact, I wanted to ask you about term data. I don't like that. <laughs> but I'm not a researcher and I guess obviously it, has, it means something in particular but it sounds like, you know, you're, in a way you're interested in hearing the stories. Um, but anyway, that's a bit of an aside. You can respond to that in a second. So I was just thinking about um, how you create spaces for deep listening, and then also like why you create spaces for dialogue. What's you know, um, I guess it's like if you're invi inviting people to be a part of something and to share stories with you, I think it's very important to frame that in why, or also that perhaps the people, whoever it is that's in that space might initiate what the conversation is, what the dialogue needs to be about, like what, is, what are the urgencies? And I think that those are the kinds of questions we've been trying to think about in relation to the neighbourhoods around this area, um, but we are coming from a very, you know, uh, a building-based um, place, but a lot of the projects we do don't take place inside this building, they take place in lots of different locations around the neighbourhood and going into a kind of other public space or spaces that people already use. Um, yeah, I think it's um, just uh, going back to the point about listening. One of my favourite texts is um, by uh, Les Bat, who wrote about the art of listening, and I think that is a really important thing. That listening, you know, how we how we how we think about conversations and how we talk about this word dialogue and how we define that is really important. And I think part of what I'm interested in doing with the shed is kind of challenging some of those definitions and also offering out the opportunity to work across kind of research community and with artists and, and pr practitioners from all different art forms to kind of really mix, you know, what happens if you kind of put all of that into one pot with this shed and what might come out of that. And I think what already I'm um, experiencing through Bearing in mind that the shed has actually already been an ongoing project for about eight, eight nine months already. Um, a lot of it has been listening and it's been talking and it's been making connections with different communities and with different 
um, cultural partners and industry partners who are already deeply rooted and embedded in various communities that are trusting in this idea of this shed project um, to, to kind of find ways to work with those groups but to do things that those groups or communities or organisations have a need or want to engage the shed in a particular way which is part of the reason why there is that unfixedness about how it's presented in the rubric so that for example with the paper birds who we've been working with who are performing on the shed next week we've been talking quite a lot about what the need is for the shed as a platform a platform for the voices of the young performers but also thinking about what, what structurally we need to do in order to support that work so it's it's coming at it from a from a pluralistic kind of um, approach to all the three main strands of the program now which really feel like it is how we blend community commission and research together and i think that's where victoria and i started talking quite a bit in terms of her research around culture and strategy um, and how that's mixed in and i think it'd be great if you could mention some of that because we haven't we haven't really had that yet yeah. thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> The, the conversations we started having was uh, were around um, my work in terms of cultural policy and the concept of an ecosystem and how it applies to that, but how art is used to make place, and then Rihanna was coming from the perspective of places really being used to make particular kinds of art. And that's pretty much where we started, but it sparked off lots of different discussions and, and planning and how now we're talking about how the pods in the shed could be used as means for starting conversations with people who have no idea about cultural policy making, don't want to either, but they do want to engage with the place that they live and they want to see different things there. So we can use this kind of artistic vehicle as a way to gather that data, sorry, and those stories, um, but to transform that into something that we can use in a, in a commissioning sense or in a policy making sense or in a research sense. Or all of those. Is that enough? Yeah, I think that's enough. <laughs> I've sort of run out of my uh, prescribed questions, which I've made uh, based on our notes on the panel. I just wonder if there's time to take any questions from the room, if anyone has any, at this stage. Yes? Hi, I'm Caroline from Dumpit. I've been working with Rhiannon and, and the people, the people on the panel. I'm just interested in that concept of deep listening. And Rebecca, is it? you might have sort of thoughts on this from, from your previous work. How do you think, particularly in the context of young people, which is where, where I'm thinking of where we're going to be working with the shed in the autumn, how do we get to that sort of deep listening when potentially we're in like a really exciting space, which is what you talked about as well, being the curiosity and the newness of it, and how do we also potentially um, get a really simple message to schools because they're so used to things being about doing, I think they might find it quite a shift for them to be thinking about children being in a space and just talking and listening. So two bits. Uh, I find that a really exciting question that you've just asked that I think we could have a whole other day discussing I'm that. Find out. And it would be really interesting <laughs> how, um, how, we, we, how we think about the types of artists and the types of work that we want to make with those young school children and with the schools to see how we bring our, our art research into those communities. Um, it, I think it will be a really interesting challenge and I don't know, I know there are strategies that as artists working with communities and, and uh, doing outreach work, there are, there are tried and tested methods on how you do that but I think like um, Beth is saying, it's how you establish those relationships in the first place and how it isn't a uh, putting on that it's a working with is a is a is a really important uh, part of, of that. Of not assuming what people want to do or want to hear. Um, yeah. and, and the, be, the, the being, the one you mentioned, Caroline. I think that's really interesting because, um, like, I, I think things are happening, like people, so artists create work and they take it out of the community. A, a, a mobile space is radical, I think it, it's, it's happening already, but I think that, you so for example, the theatre makers that I work with, they are making great work and they're making great work with communities quite often, 
Um, but they might not consider that as research. And I think that, I mean, I've learned a huge amounts since we're doing Alex in Victoria about how um, there's things that we're doing that are just, that, that can be packaged and can um, be um, sort of used and, uh, I, I don't know what the other word is, but for, uh, as research. Um, so that it removes it from the data and it becomes, or well, I don't know if it does, maybe it doesn't, but it, <laughs> it, it, it removes it from that place and it becomes a lot more organic. Um, and I'm excited to see, like Rihanna says, about the possibilities of what just having those heads in the room or in the shed do, do to, to, to artists and, and, and communities as well. So, well, you know, because if it's already happening, we're just not realising what's there already. Yeah, I think it's just about looking at it in a different way. You've got the methods and you do that to, to workshop a piece of performance. You have that kind of deep listening process if you're kind of iteratively developing something anyway, it's just that you're perhaps putting that in a different set of surroundings. You do want that quick fix sort of sell to a school that you're sending it into, but you, you know how to do it and just translating that. Sure. Um, I guess um, just one thing I thought I'd sort of bring in to this and responding to your question is about timescales. So um, I don't quite know that how long the shed will be in situ when it is doing its thing and <laughs> different, different lengths of time. So, um, you know, I've been involved in projects that happen in, you know, in two hours and that's the only, that's it. And I've also, lots of the things we're doing through the Making Place programme happen over a year or more. Um, and there's obviously different types of listening and different types of conversation and levels of trust that are built in mm. three, three different time scales. I don't, I don't think that something being kind of short and, you know, um, what's the word? I call it one half an hour. Well, I was thinking, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, not that. <laughs> so, so that doesn't, I, I think that doesn't mean that you can't have a really kind of deep interaction or quality, you know, there, there can still be something that really happens in that time. It's just that you wouldn't expect to, have, like, develop relationships of trust with and get to the point of a project where the, the people who you maybe first met on the street are then the decision makers and are leading on that project, you know, that those are different processes that take different amounts of time. And, um, so yeah, I guess I just, um, I guess that one thing, I don't know, I don't know about remaster schools, um, but um, the, the thing, the, the starting point like, that I try and take with all of the projects we're doing to make in place is we have these kind of three questions that I guess are our research questions that run through over like years uh, through the projects. Um, one of them is about what do places inherit, and it's kind of again trying to use a different word to have them than heritage. So it's sort of thinking about the multiple stories, um, the many many lives that are lived in a place, and how which of those are visible, which of those are celebrated, and which ones you might have to kind of spend a lot longer digging to find and to share. Um, the second question is about who imagines the city, um, and so for me that's a really important question about. Um, power in terms of what happens in public space, whose voices are heard, how spaces that people are imagining together are even created and who's invited into those spaces, who has access to imagining, and um, we all imagine, but who's, you know, who gets to kind of visibilize or verbalize that. And then the third space is about interventions, and um, but that's the third question. And when you, there's something really lovely about a project like this because you can you know, presuming you have to get permission, but you can put a structure up and you can intervene in a public space in a way that lots of people can interact with. Um, when you start to look at intervention on a kind of planning level, I mean, I've, I went, I, I asked that question pretty naively at the beginning of the process, and now I've learned a lot more about those systems. Sorry, that was kind of went off on a tangent. <laughs> that was really helpful. Did you want to say something? Sorry. Uh, no, just, I mean, I, I, I guess picking up on your point, Caroline. So. The, the projects we're immediately using Shed 4R, as, as Rianne said, were with um, Derby Theatre, so Caroline and Alex in, in the room, um, and two different theatre companies, Paper Birds and Curious Monkey. And that builds on some of the work that Derby Theatre's been doing with young people already, especially uh, uh, young people in care. Uh, and those projects have a variety of different objectives. And perhaps the one that you mentioned, Caroline, is the kind of lowest order one in, in terms of the eyes of the powerful, so the people who are funding it. So 
often they're, they're about skills building for young people, so they're about individuals competing for a position in a social hierarchy, and then you get lots of different artists coming to the project which are about challenging the social hierarchy in, 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 in and itself. Uh, and then one of the things we found through that work was that young people come to these things just wanting to enjoy themselves. Uh, and I, I guess part of what we, what we want to do with that next phase is foreground manager that, that, um, that opportunity. Um, whether that's an effective sale to schools or not, I'm, I'm not sure. On, on this point of data versus stories, <laughs> so I mean, I, you know, you'll see me frowning a lot here because this is this is a problem I'm working through, right? So, and I don't, I don't, I'm not alone in that, and it's not, you know, I don't think there's a persuasive answer to that. So, everything I, you know, usually my pressure as a social scientist is to be, um, is to have replicable results that are representative of something, uh, and there's power in that. You know, there, there is obviously a, a power in that, but then recognizing exactly as you say that when you work in a genuinely co-creative way, you're going to produce something that could never be the same in another place at another point in time because you're giving particular uh, voices a, a stage. And I guess my problem is trying to reconcile those two things because the data element is when you take all those stories and say, what does it mean for society? What does it mean for people who might find something differently in, 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 in the future? Um, but I don't know. I would be in defence a little bit, <laughs> not throw it out the window, but recognising each other. I think this is just a start, isn't it, to our conversation, and, and hopefully the, the, the dialogue will continue tonight and beyond um, through the lifetime of the project. And there is more information about the project here. If you haven't put one up already, please do. It also has the list of roles on the back, as Ben said, is the roof. Um, Rian is the nuts and bolts. Um, Please do ask more about the project while you're here tonight. Um, and perhaps it will reconfigure both itself as a space, but also perhaps our vocabulary. And we'll start thinking about the difference between impact and difference, or data and stories, and place and space, and making place and place making. But thank you to the panel very much for taking part in this discussion. Thank you all for coming. And we'll have a good round of applause for the panel. I'm now going to introduce um, Antoinette, Dr. Antoinette Birchall, who's going to be speaking to us about It Takes a Region to Raise an Artist.